Okay, on to our first panel. A reminder, as Chris said, to post your questions and rate questions via Pigeon. And to speakers who are live today and not recorded, to please stick to the 15 minute time frame. It, it will be very difficult for me to flag you if you're over, so I'm leaving that to you. Um, also, Audrey Disitu's Decision Making in Slime Molds talk, she couldn't be with us today, so that's available on the web asynchronously. Now, the speakers on our first panel will be addressing collective intelligence issues in the context of biological, neural, and robotic systems. And I'm going to introduce each person before they speak. Talia Wheatley starts us off. Talia is a professor in the Dartmouth Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences, where she runs the Social Systems Research Lab. She works on how minds align, transfer, and share information. And how her talk today, the title of it is How Conversation Creates Neural Synchrony in Groups. So welcome, Talia. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, can everybody see me and hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and can I share my screen? Yes. Okay. So we're still not viewing your screen, Talia. We're still yep, pretty yep, yep. Do you see it now? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Um, first, thank you, Jessica and Walter and uh, Chris and Zach for putting this on. I'm excited to learn from all the speakers and uh, see the posters. I'm gonna be talking about how conversation creates neural synchrony in groups of humans. And uh, first thing I wanna do is acknowledge the engine behind all this work, which is my lab, uh, post and present, and in particular, uh, these two people, Carolyn Parkinson, who's now a professor at UCLA, and Bo Sievers, who's uh, finishing up a postdoc at Harvard and is gonna be looking for a job. So for those of you who may have a job to give Bo, he's excellent. Um, and Sophie Wolchen, I'm not gonna be talking about her work, but uh, she does excellent um, uh, neural synchrony work through the lens of pupil dilations, and she has a poster. So please uh, look for that. Okay, the first uh, study that I wanna present, I wanna give you two studies that we've done on this idea of how conversation aligns minds. And the first is uh, work by Carolyn Parkinson when she was a grad student with me. And our question was, are we friends with people of a similar mind? And now this is a very ancient intuition. This is birds of a feather uh, flock together from the 15th century. And I'm sure it goes back uh, beyond that. But basically, oh, oops. Ah, something froze. Okay, can you see that? You can see that now, a new slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, when we think about homophily or um, what sort of clusters people together, we often think about demographics. So people cluster on age, for example, or gender. Think about the friends that you have, they're probably similar in age um, to you, for example. But there are all sorts of ways uh, that people cluster and you can, you can start to study this by looking at a social network. I keep losing privileges, okay. Um, and the nice thing about being at Dartmouth, which is I'm external faculty at SFI, but I'm, my primary job is professor at Dartmouth. And Dartmouth, if you know uh, colleges in the US, know it's pretty remote. It's in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire. And uh, it's beautiful, but there are no people. There you see some people in the bottom left, or bottom right, but that's about it. And if you look at the business school, it's even more cloistered, it's even more isolated. So this is Tuck, the business school. And the nice thing about Tuck is that uh, students uh, in Tuck, they study together, they take classes together, they eat together, they even live together, all in interconnected buildings. So they don't even have to leave their little campus within this isolated community. And it's really the ideal opportunity to study a closed social network. And so we asked all of a Tuck cohort of 250 um, MBA students this very simple question. 
Consider the people with whom you like to spend your free time. Since you arrived at Dartmouth, who are the classmates you've been with most often for informal social activities, such as going out to lunch, dinner, drinks, films, visiting one another's homes, and so on. And basically what this question is setting up is, okay, this is a definition of what a friend is. And then we give them this big roster of all 250 of their classmates, and we basically say, okay, who are you friends with? Check them off. And because we got everybody to do this as part of the coursework, we could establish what this network really looks like, who's friends with whom. And the orange circles that you see are the people that we uh, studied in, in this um, brain scan. And what you can see uh, with the orange dots is that some people are friends. That means they are one path length removed from each other. They both say that they're friends with each other. You can also see that some people are friends of friends. They're not directly friends, but they're friends through someone else. And there are people who are friends of friends of friends, which is uh, three path lengths removed. All right, we got these people into a scanner one at a time, and we showed them previously unseen video clips. So nobody had seen these before, and we're just scanning their brains while they're watching. And I'm gonna give you a sense of the breadth of things that we showed them, comedy clips, political videos, science videos, et cetera. But keep in mind that what they saw was much longer versions of all of these things, but I wanna give you a sense of what they saw. Okay, so we showed them those video clips and I'm, I'm hoping that you heard the sound there, um, but I'll just go on and assume that's the case. Um, what we did was we had them watch those video clips and then we took their brain images and we uh, basically packaged, parcelated them into 80 different bits of the brain. And then we did something very mathematically simple, which is we took the time series of the oxygenation levels uh, in each uh, brain area, the average oxygenation levels. So when neurons fire, they eat up oxygen and then blood uh, comes in and compensates for that decreased oxygen in the blood and uh, that we can track that with fMRI. And so that's a basically a, an um, indirect measure of neural activity, this, um, these time series of oxygen levels. And we can compare uh, how similar two, two people are by comparing the time series from the, the equivalent parts of the brain pairwise across everybody in the sample. And uh, here's what we found. Uh, you don't need to read all of these. These are the 80 different regions um, that were anatomically divided in everybody's brain. And what was remarkable was that if you look at the overall similarity between people, when you have friends of friends of friends, these are people who are three path lengths removed in a network, you see that on average across all of these brain regions, they are relatively dissimilar. The patterns of their neural activity are relatively dissimilar compared to if you go in just one step, um, that's another way of looking at it, um, painted onto the brain. If you go one step closer in in a network to friends of friends, then the brain starts to look um, much more similar as responding in a more similar way. And friends are remarkably similar. Not every single brain area, but the vast majority of brain areas, friends seem to have uh, brain activity that is much more in sync with each other. Now they're just watching the movies by themselves. Um, they've never seen them before, but people who are naturally friends in a network tend to see the world the same way. So are we friends with people of a similar mind? The answer is yes, because the deep question is 
why are we friends with people of a similar mind? And there are two um, possibilities, right, that are not mutually exclusive. One is, do we just befriend people who are like us? Do we come into the world a certain way and we find people who are like us and those people are our friends? Or do we shape each other? When we're thrown together, do we influence each other? Do we become more similar due to shared experience? Now, I sure hope the answer to the, to the second question is yes. I mean, if you look at our entire justice system, it depends on jury deliberations that assume this is true. And I think if you see things like, you know, public opinion changing on gay marriage or Black Lives Matter, it must be the case that we shape each other. And we wanted to look under the hood and see sort of how this works. So this is the second study I wanna talk about. And this is done with Bo Sievers. Um, and uh, Chris Walker, who's a grad student of mine, Adam Kleinbaum, again at Talk, and my collaborator, Uri Hassan at Princeton. So in this study, uh, people are watching movie clips again, but this time the sound's off and they can't really tell what's going on by design. They are ambiguous movies. And I'm gonna give you a clip, just a little snippet, so you can see that it's quite hard to tell what's going on. Okay, so what's going on there? What is Nicole Kidman doing? What's her relationship with the kid? It's very difficult to understand. And so we had people watch these things while they're in the magnet, and then we brought them together. And we got them in groups of uh, anywhere from three to six people, and we had them have hash out their interpretations of what was happening in the clips and come to a consensus for each clip they saw. And then we put them back in the scanner and we had them see the clips again, right? Now, after having discussed them as a group, they saw the same clips again. And they also saw new clips from further along in the movie. So the same characters, but they'd never seen them before and therefore had never discussed them. And the first result is that conversation indeed synchronizes brain activity within groups. It shapes people to uh, help them coalesce their mental models. Um, the way we showed this is a very, very simply, again, intersubject correlation. So for all person pairs, for all movies, we looked at how similar people are before and after conversation. And we created these things we call change maps, which is simply um, how much did they change? How much did they come into alignment after conversation uh, relative to before? And the main finding is this, that across the brain, um, you see that people come into alignment. They, these areas of the brain, um, the lateral views are on the left and the right are the medial views. Um, these are all the brain areas that had increased synchrony when viewing the clips a second time after conversation. Now this is only true within a group. It isn't true across groups. It isn't true for control participants who never had a conversation. It's not about seeing them a second time. It's not about uh, just talking about anything. It's that within a group that those group members came to see the world in the same way. And this synchrony persisted even for novel clips. It aligned people's mental models and those persisted into the future and changed the way they saw new information. And what was discussed mattered. So if you look at one group, um, looking at several different movies, you'll see that the alignment patterns, so the bright green areas are the areas that came into alignment after conversation. Those change depending on what movie they're watching. And that makes sense because the brain doesn't have an alignment area that becomes more active. It's that uh, depending on what is discussed, depending on the interpretations that you come up with, that changes how you become in sync and what parts of the brain get into sync. And even if you take the one same movie, like this movie that you uh, saw a clip of, and you look across groups, you'll see that even though they saw the exact same movie, because they had different interpretations through conversation, they came to be in, to, in alignment with each other in different ways. But, and across all of these cases, if you look at a single region that comes into alignment, what you'll see is the same thing. That before conversation, everybody looks sort of idiosyncratic. Each line here is a different person in the group. And this is their brain activity um, 
superimposed on top of each other before conversation when viewing a clip, and this is after conversation. And you can see how tight it gets because now people are seeing it through the same lens. And you can in fact do um, a contrast here and look for the change in intersubject correlation. Where, where, where in terms of the clip that they're watching do people have the biggest shifts in coming into synchrony? And you can see here are some of the peaks and these uh, correspond to the pivot pivotal sort of narrative moments in a clip. So here at the end is when he sinks to the floor. This is when groups say, okay, that's the moment that defines this clip and that's what we were talking about in the conversation. So I, what I, one thing I didn't tell you is whether or not people come into alignment in exactly the same amount, so everybody comes an equal amount together, or whether people have a disproportionate influence on that sort of neural gravity, whether some people have a disproportionate um, sort of force on, the, on how people sort of, who aligns to whom. And because we engineered the group from the top population, we actually could tell who are the most influential people in their network and see if that made an effect. And in fact, it did. So if you take, um, I'm not gonna have time to go into this, but if you take um, centrality measures, people who are influential in their network in terms of centrality and you do a, a PCA, so you get a, a general centrality measure, um, who's more central than others. Uh, these are the people in our sample, um, the bigger dots are the more central. And we made pool maps um, as to who, pull, who pulls whom. And the question is, do highly central people exert pull on others' mental states? And the answer that we found is that not really. Centrality did not predict pull on others in terms of them, uh, so highly central people pulling others to their own point of view as much as the opposite, that being highly central predicted being pulled by others more, by being adaptive to other points of view, and in fact, then rallying the group around that point of view and increasing synchrony that way. So in summary, in this conversation study, people's brains become more synchronized after conversation. That localization is content and context dependent, depending on what they talked about. And highly central people are more likely to adapt their neural patterns to others in the group. I think the nice, I wanna end with this sort of metaphor of uh, this video of metronomes. And you're gonna see that they're starting off in different places, but here's my colleague Uri Hassan putting them on cylinders so they can in fact provide feedback to each other. They can talk to each other. And you'll see that they come into alignment, right? Now, this is kind of a cute metaphor for conversation, but I don't think it's wrong. I think that conversation is in fact neurofeedback. Um, it's the primary mechanism we have as a species to influence other minds and through which we align our mental models to each other. It's the game changer that separated us from other apes. We think about language as being the game changer. Well, yes, but it's a common language that made the difference. It isn't about putting thoughts into sounds so much as it is about having those sound meaning mappings that uh, create a platform for other minds to meet, right? Talking changes thinking, not only in the speaker, but critically in the listener. And it is the reason why conversation is the most ubiquitous behavior of our species, even now with social distancing and masks. And for good reason, it allows uh, conversation to conversation. It allows ideas to leap from one brain to the next and ripple outward through the vast social networks we inhabit. Thank you. Good morning and uh, thank you for attending this meeting. So as you know, there exists a large number of uh, animal species living in groups or in societies in which individuals have the capacity to coordinate their actions and achieve a huge diversity of collective tasks. And this is commonly used to illustrate uh, the concept of uh, collective intelligence. It can be for instance, the capacity uh, of some species of ants to self-assemble and form chains that are used collectively to pull a, a large prey. And it can be uh, the capacity uh, of some termite species to build a huge and remarkably 
complex nest, it can also be the ability of uh, many species of uh, social insects to collectively uh, choose the best food source or uh, the optimal building, uh, optimal site to build a nest, or the ability of many species of uh, uh, birds or fish that lives in groups to uh, coordinate their movements. And all this collective performance results from the uh, interaction that takes place between the individuals uh, that make up this group. And during these interactions, uh, the individual exchange some information, either directly or indirectly, by means of traces that they leave uh, in the environment. And this is these interactions that makes possible the uh, coordination of individual activities. So when we try to understand the mechanisms that allow a group of organisms to collectively solve a problem, the first and essential step will be to decipher uh, and characterize interactions that take place between uh, in individuals. And this is what has been done by an increasing uh, number of research groups over the last uh, uh, 30 years. So today, we are in the beginning of having a fairly general idea of the types of interaction that allow groups of organisms to coordinate their actions. And we know in particular that these interactions are generally uh, short range, which means that uh, individuals only use local information about what happened in their environment. So the scale uh, of these interaction is quite small in comparison uh, to uh, the scale of the structure built by the group or the structure that emerge uh, at, uh, at the group uh, level. And also very often, individuals select uh, the information to which they pay attention. So there is uh, also some kind of information filtering. Individuals react to some information uh, in their environment, for instance, some specific behavioral actions performed by uh, the other group members. Uh, and they seem to completely ignore other kind of information. And we will see that information filtering not only allows individuals to efficiently coordinate their behaviors, uh, but also, it also each individual to minimize the cognitive load which is necessary uh, to achieve the coordination. And this is what I would like uh, to talk to you about today through the particular example of collective behavior of fish group. So how can hundreds of fish move together uh, in, a, in a coordinated way and behave as if they, uh, they were the same single superorganism? is one of the most captivating uh, mysteries observable in nature. And as you can see, these groups of organisms it can spontaneously uh, adopt uh, many different collective phases that can be uh, rather disordered or much more organized. And uh, for a long period of time, it was uh, quite difficult to obtain uh, accurate data uh, on the collective movements of animal groups. So most of, of studies on these uh, phenomena mainly relied on the analysis of mathematical models. In particular, in the 80s and 90s, many uh, phenomenological models have been developed, and each of these models were based on specific uh, individual interaction rules, and they were able to qualitatively reproduce the collective movements of schools of fish or flocks of birds that closely resemble those observed in nature. And for instance, if we look at some classical models of collective motion, such as the aoki cousin model and also the Vichek model, they consider that within a group, each individual is influenced by all the neighbors that are located uh, within a special neighborhood. And for instance, in the Vichek model, each individual align its uh, direction of motion with the average direction of all individuals that are located in its neighborhood. However, the main uh, problem remained the lack of experimental validation uh, of the hypothesis upon which uh, these models uh, were based on, and particularly the hypothesis that concerned the interaction rules uh, at the individual scale, simply because very different interaction rules uh, at individual scales are able to uh, produce very similar collective uh, dynamics. But now for a few years, uh, new methods that are based on machine learning algorithm have been developed to automatically track the trajectories and the behavior of uh, animals moving in group. And these techniques have greatly improved the uh, accuracy uh, of the available data on social interaction. And they have also opened the way to build models of collective movement that are both quantitative and predictive. 
Now, the main difficulty uh, in building such models lies in uh, the close entanglement of the interactions between animals and their physical and social environments. And to solve this problem, uh, some years ago, we have developed a method uh, that consists in, fir in the first step to use experimental data to model uh, the spontaneous movement of an isolated individual that doesn't encounter uh, any physical obstacle on its way. And then in a second step, we use uh, this model to measure the effect um, uh, on the individual movements of its interaction with obstacle and with another individual which is present in its neighborhood. And then uh, in a third step, we can validate uh, the model of individual movement that include these interactions by comparing its prediction with the data collected uh, from various experimental conditions, including experiments that were not used to build the model. And we can also try to understand how individuals combine uh, information from multiple neighbors when uh, screaming in a school. So we have successfully applied these methods to analyze and model the movement and the social interactions in uh, several species of fish, and in particular in the Romino's uh, tetra that you can see here. Uh, this is a, a small a tropical freshwater fish whose average uh, body length is about uh, 30 millimeter and that swims in groups uh, in a highly synchronized and polarized manner. And like many other species of fish, these tetra uh, perform a burst and coast type of swimming, which is characterized by sequences of sudden increase in speed, followed by mostly uh, uh, passive gliding periods. So if we look at the variation uh, of the velocity uh, with time, you can clearly see this uh, succession of short acceleration phases followed uh, by gliding phases during which uh, the velocity uh, decreases. And the short events during which uh, a fish uh, changes both its velocity and its direction of motion are called kicks. And uh, this particular intermittent uh, swimming mode makes it possible to analyze a fish trajectory as a series of discrete behavioral decisions in time and space. But the main interest of, the, of this uh, swimming mode is that we can also use the special location where the kick uh, has been performed by the fish to precisely identify the potential stimuli um, in the neighborhood that have elicited the behavioral response of the fish. And by accumulating uh, several 10 hours of data on fish swimming alone or in pairs, we can identify the stimuli a fish reacts to. We can also measure the effect of this stimuli uh, on the behavioral response of the, of the fish. So let me just focus on the social interactions between uh, two fish. What we found in this species is a combination of attraction and alignment, which are represented here uh, respectively in red and blue, whose intensity depends basically on three parameters, the distance between the fish, the uh, angular position of the fish and also their relative uh, orientation. So the strength of this attraction and alignment interaction depends on these three uh, parameters. So for instance, if we look at the influence of the distance between two fish and the intensity of uh, alignment and attraction, we can see that when the distance is small, uh, let's say that uh, 30 millimeters, uh, which correspond to one body length, there is a short range uh, repulsion. And then, as the distance between the fish increases, we can see that the attraction, which is figured here in red, becomes more important and reaches a maximum value of uh, around 200 millimeters, which corresponds to about six to seven body lengths. And we can also see that the alignment in blue dominates the attraction uh, up to 2.5 body lengths, while the attraction becomes dominant uh, um, for larger distances. And as the distance between fish increases even more, we anticipate that the attraction will, of course, decrease. What we can also notice is a strong modulation of the behavioral response of the fish that depend on their relative position. And this is a direct consequence of their anisotropic perception of the environment. So this means that the interaction between two fish are asymmetric. In particular, the maximum amplitude uh, of the alignment occurs when the neighboring fish is located on the front left or on the front uh, right, and then the alignment vanishes as its position uh, moves toward the back uh, of the uh, focal fish. And we can also see uh, uh, that the attraction is maximum when uh, the other fish is located on the side 
of the focal fish and it increases with its relative size, in particular when the neighbor is in front of the focal fish and with the same uh, orientation of the focal fish, you can see that uh, the attraction is minimum simply because its relative size from the point of view of the focal fish is also very small. Then it is quite easy to fit on these experimental data some mathematical functions that are represented here uh, on this graph by uh, the full lines to model the social interactions between fish. And the simulation of the model shows uh, that uh, these interactions can reproduce both uh, qualitatively and quantitatively the movements of fish that we observe in uh, the experiment. And, it, and in particular, you can see that the fish tend to stay close to the wall and also close to each other. But you can also see that the temporary leader, which is in the front, is much closer to the wall than the follower. And there is also a very good agreement between the model and the experiments if we consider the distance uh, between a fish and also the distribution of the orientation of the fish with regard uh, to the wall. And then uh, the big question is to understand how fish combine and integrate the interactions with many neighbors when they travel in group. And to answer these questions, we need to know for each fish and at each moment, which neighbor influences its behavior. And more precisely, we need to know the number of neighbors uh, a fish pay attention to and also the strategy for selecting these neighbors. So to get answer to these questions, we perform a series of experiments in which groups of uh, five fish um, uh, we are moving uh, in a circular tank and we use the model that we developed for these species to investigate different hypotheses about the number of neighbors a fish pay attention to and also the strategy to choose these neighbors. And then uh, we have compared the simulation results uh, for this experiment, for these different hypotheses with uh, what we observe uh, in the uh, experiments. So we have investigated uh, three different strategies of interaction. The first strategy is based on the distance between uh, individuals, so that fish interact with their k uh, nearest neighbors with um, uh, k varying from one to three. The second is a random strategy. The k uh, neighbors are randomly uh, sampled among uh, the other fish with k varying also from one to three. And in the third strategy, the selected neighbors are those who have the largest influence uh, on the uh, instantaneous heading variation of the focal individual. And to measure the respective influence of each neighbor uh, of a focal fish, we use uh, the pairwise interaction function that we have implemented in the model with two fish. So that each time a fish performed a kick, we can precisely know which of its neighbor has the largest influence on its heading variation. So with all these interaction strategies, we can explore different ways for an individual to focus its attention on the most relevant stimuli uh, in its neighborhood. I don't have time to uh, describe in detail all the results that we got, but in summary, it clearly appears that uh, uh, the collective behavior that we observe in the experiments can only be reproduced by the model when each individual interacts with at least two of its neighbors and no clear gain uh, is obtained when individuals interact with a third additional neighbor. And even more, when fish only interact with one neighbor, uh, the most influential strategy leads to the best coordination, even when the group moves in an unbounded space. And this remains true for large group. And here you can see on this simulation that groups of 10 and 20 individuals that only interact with their most influential neighbor remains crazy. So uh, now uh, to uh, summarize and conclude, uh, our result strongly suggests that each fish in a school must acquire only a minimal amount of information about the behavior of its neighbor to, uh, to get a coordination of swimming at the group level. And this process may prevent uh, information overload when the fish move in large groups. We know that in invertebrates, the midbrain and the forebrains are working in parallel to, uh, to process the visual information and select the most uh, salient stimuli that are the focus of attention. And in particular, the midbrain continuously monitor the environment for the relevant stimuli. So it is the, the primary site uh, where the information about the neighbors is filtered. And then the forebrain select those stimuli on which the fish focus its attention. 
And our results suggest that fish do not have to pay attention to uh, all their surrounding neighbors. They do not have to integrate all that information. They just have to react to the two most influential neighbors. And this is enough to ensure the coordination of swimming uh, in, a, in a group. So finally, I would like to thank all these people that have been uh, involved in this work. Uh, Liu Lei, uh, Daniel Calodi, Valentin Le Cheval, and Ramon Escobedo, who work in my group in Toulouse, and also Clément Cyr from the Laboratory of Theoretical Physics in Toulouse. Thank you very much for your attention. Today, I wanted to bring you on a journey engineering swarms across scale, from the nanoscale to the robot scale. And our source of inspiration are really these flocks of birds. If you look at these birds, they can do beautiful complex dances in the skies. And there's many features that are interesting for real world applications. For example, if you keep adding birds to the flock, the flock continues to fly so they can scale to huge numbers. If a bird falls to the ground, the whole flock doesn't crash to the ground. So they're individually, uh, they're robust individual failure. And together they can do more than the sum of their parts. For example, they might be better at avoiding predators. And what's fascinating is that there's no central leader telling every bird what to do. It's just the result of every bird reacting to its local environment and that gives rise to these desired flocking behaviors. And you see examples of self-organization like this everywhere in nature, whether it's in ants as they create trails to your picnic table or in honeybees as they make decisions about their next nest site or the ability to grow fully functioning human beings just from a couple cells. So the challenge we face as swarm engineers is very often we have a swarm behavior we want to achieve, say flocking, decision-making, trail formation, morphogenesis, but we need to back out those individual rules, those simple designs that give you the desired behavior. And so in my team, we do this in two different ways. One is we take inspiration from the wonderful work that's been done by biologists uh, and apply that in the engineering world. And the other, if there is no relevant bio inspiration or there's just no known rules that we can use, then we need to explore. So that could be guessing these rule sets or it could be doing machine learning so that we can automatically come up with solutions to our swarm challenge. So, when we use bioinspiration, we can go and put these rules on board robots. Here you see a swarm of flying robots that we did over at the Floriano lab. Here's their GPS trajectory, and here they're using the basic Reynolds flocking rules. And you see these circular topologies, these circular dances that emerge, uh, which is actually what we predicted because we do a lot of simulation to see what should ever happen. And we throw these robots in the air. We can show that these rules work. We can also do the more learning approach. So here, what you have is a swarm of robots that are learning on the go how to swarm. Their goal is to push a frisbee from the center of the arena to one side of the arena. And we're using artificial evolution of behavior trees to automatically come up con with controllers that are human understandable. And we hear really in 15 minutes, they figure it out from not knowing how to swarm to figuring out how to push this frisbee. And this is all done on board the robot. So we have good tools that allow us to build swarm behaviors and to push them to reality. Now, this is all interesting, but fundamentally it's, you know, 10 robots, 20 robots, sometimes up to 100. And in my mind, swarms need to work in much, much larger numbers. And so I got excited about the field of nanomedicine and the ability of nanoparticles because of their size to essentially leak out of vessels into certain types of tumors. And so that makes them useful vehicles for the delivery of drugs or diagnostics directly to tumor tissue. And in Sangita Bhatia's laboratory, where I went from three years, uh, they were able to create particles with different sizes, particles with different shapes. This might be an iron oxide nanoworm, for example. Some of these particles had different charges or could even be energy receptive. So that meant you could use light or magnetic fields to activate them. You could decorate these particles with molecules that allow them to bind to receptors overexpressed on certain cancer cells, and you could load them with a drug that you could release in a more or less controlled fashion. So there's many knobs that you could turn on the design of these particles, and these particles, they work you know, per injection in the 10 to the power 13. So there's the sheer giant number that I was excited about. And so 
we went to think about how we can make these particles work together. But before we went uh, into something that was a little bit too far-fetched and futuristic, we started out by scenarios that were closer to home, closer to application. So here's just one scenario. Here you have one particle, we can change its size, that changes how fast it diffuses in the tumor, and we change its coding, which changes how sticky it is to the receptors that are on our cancer cells. And in our model, these particles leak out from the vessel and need to go deep into the tumor, killing at least 20 cells deep. So they need to accumulate to the level where they kill at least 20 cells deep. And we thought that was uh, a challenging scenario. If we could do that, we would do a decent job at the tumor we were considering. So we did loads of simulation, which is the backbone of everything that we do in swarming. And just looking at this, here you see how fast they are, here you see how sticky they are, and our goal is to kill 20 cells. And we noticed that most of these particle formulations would not kill 20 cells. And if you look on the right, these are stochastic simulations, you can basically see that just turning those two knobs completely changes the distributions of nanoparticles that you see in the tumor. For example, A was a particle that was very sticky. And so if you were to test this in a dish with cancer cells, it would look great because those particles would essentially stick to all the cancer cells and kill those cells in the dish, in those well-mixed environments. Whereas in my line of tumors, tumor cells, the particles leak out, stick to the first cells they encounter, and never go deep into the tumor tissue. So that's really an example where the collective behavior of all these particles in these complex environments does matter for the clinical outcome. And we've since then been working on making more realistic models of these tumors so that we now have cell surfaces, so that we have a better understanding of what happens if there's heterogeneity. And on the bottom, you see uh, one of our, our microfluidic devices, a little tumor on a chip with blue and green nanoparticles penetrating our artificial tumors so that we can see under the microscope the things that we're implementing in silico and hopefully understand these dynamics a little bit better. Ultimately, uh, as part of this Evo Nano project, we're trying to automate the full pipeline. So say you have a tumor scenario and you're trying to treat the specific tumor. How can you use multi-scale modeling to understand where the nanoparticles go through the body, how they move through a tumor, how they move through a cell to actually have the desired impact? And how can you use machine learning to automatically design those particles so that at the end of this computational pipeline, you have a particle suggestion that you can go and test in vitro and in vivo before pushing to the more translational side uh, in the clinic. And we also designed as part of this process a game called Nanodoc that allows us to explore, again, this idea of exploring swarm behaviors through crowdsourcing. So here what we have on the right are scenarios, and on the left we have different nanoparticles uh, editors, so we can go, the crowd can go and design different nanoparticles, click inject, and see those particles and their collective behavior in our virtual tumors. And this actually uses parameters from, from our nanoparticle simulator that are relevant. So we taught the crowd lots of things. We taught them about tumor cells and healthy cells, because otherwise the solution to everything is to dump loads of drugs, and we wanted to be more specific with our treatments. We taught them about changing the dosage of the nanoparticles, when you inject them, combining particles, you can change the size or the speed of the particles. Some of these cancer cells have molecules or receptors on their surface, and you can make particles that stick to those receptors. You can load those particles with a drug, and you can make a smart material where if something activates the particle, it's going to release, a, it's going to release its payload in the environment. And then finally, we have the ability of these particles to self-assemble and to disassemble, which speeds them up or slows them down. So if you're a swarm roboticist, you start saying, you know, these particles have an ability to sense their environment, to act on their environment by releasing something. That thing they release could activate another particle. So now you have communication. And through self-assembly and disassembly, you can change their motion, even though I can't make them go left and right like I could with the flying robots, I can make them stop 
and go or speed up and slow down. So this has led to around 180,000 simulations uh, done by the crowd around the world. And we've since then uh, started using this to train a neural network uh, so that we could bootstrap and essentially give it a scenario. And this trained uh, neural network could spit out the right vehicle design for that specific scenario. And we also spent some time playing our own game so that we could uh, start to explore some of the more swarmy behaviors we were interested. So here is an example of trail formation, loosely inspired from the way ants uh, do trail formation, but we've relaxed, relaxed all directionality. They can't go left or right, for example. Turns out we've ended up with something that looks a lot like diffusion limited aggregation, if any of you are interested in this. And we started wondering, how could we actually test this uh, in the tiny scales? How could we see these algorithms emerge? And we thought that one way to do it, rather than have to engineer chemically a specific particle, might need to give them a sense of augmented reality. And so this is the idea. We have real particles, real particles that are micro or nanoscaled. And rather than engineer their ability to communicate, for example, we could project light halos around them. And that would allow you to test with kind of a merge between the real world and the simulated world, how this influences the collective behavior. So you could change their, their communication range very easily, for example. And you could have particles that react to that light that's projected by doing something interesting. So in the case of trail formation, you might, for example, project a light halo. These particles would then stick to this light halo and you would detect that. And then you would project a communication halo around those stopped particles. And maybe you could do something like trail formation in the real world at the tiny scale. And so with this in mind, we've designed the dome, which is essentially our system for closed loop control of micro micro agents. Essentially what it is is a projector. And this projector projects in, in around 800 by 400 pixels. Each pixel is the size of a cell, depending on your magnification. And then uh, we can detect using a Raspberry Pi camera what's happened and change our projection. So that allows us to do things like augmented reality. Here you see microparticles receiving communication halos and forming a trail. And here you see game of life that's virtually imposed upon this biological sample. And here are all these bubbles, the blue ones uh, that are floating our Volvox. And those Volvox, so the natural world is sitting the artificial world and here we're running um, the game of life rules in honor to Conway who sadly uh, died of COVID um, as part of this crisis. So when you go from the robot world to the nano world you start thinking in huge numbers and so since then we've started wondering what we could do um, you know in, in things that worked in the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands maybe the millions and so this is just an example. If you think of these, these farms, you know, if you were to plant seeds, you would sequentially zigzag through the farm and plant seeds one after the other um, in a sequential way. But if you think in the same way as the nano and the micro world think, well, maybe you would have 100 million robot seeds that deploy over this farm field, plant themselves and biodegrade with maybe just the right amount of nutrients that they need for that farm. And it turns out it's not that crazy to think in huge scales with very simple rules that are inspired from the micro and nano world. So you remember that trail formation I showed that was in the simulated nano world? Well, this is that same rule set on a swarm of 100 coin-sized real robots in the laboratory. And just simple random motion, local communication, and you see they go from random motion to the emergence of these trails. Um, with very little calibration. So you could see how you could, actually there's no calibration. You could see how you would scale this up, just producing robots and putting them in the scenario. Mm -hmm. Here what you're seeing is decision-making with a swarm of 400 robots. Uh, here the robots, this is inspired from honeybees, but again, random motion, really simple local interactions. And the goal is for them to turn blue if they're making the right decision. And here they go, they're blue from the initial state. There was blue and red. And here's an example of morphogenesis inspired uh, from how, how, how shapes form uh, during embryogenesis. So here are robots, we have 350, uh, are essentially uh, serving as cells and they have two morphogens that they react locally on the robot and then these morphogen concentrations virtually diffuse throughout the swarm. And what you get is spots and stripes 
very similar to what Turing uh, described you would get with cellular systems. And we can use those spots to grow artificial limbs and create self-organized shapes. And because of this self-organization, you can chop the limbs off, you can split the swarm and they regrow. So we get a lot of features for free from these very, very basic fundamental um, behaviors that actually would work at the micro and nano scale and work in robotics when we scale up to huge numbers. So the last thing that we're trying to do in my team is to figure out how to make swarms for people because I feel like we've cracked a little bit the hardware, a little bit the software, and so we're trying to make this a reality. And so one of the papers I'll be presenting at this conference has to do with a use case study we did with firefighters, with people who work in warehouses, with people who do bridge inspection to understand what they would care about in the deployment of swarms in their workplaces. And it turns out they're interested, they're keen, but we need to do it right, not a surprise. Uh, and we do a lot of, of public outreach as well. So this is swarm escape, and a proper escape group takes you between 30 minutes to an hour to break out, uh, where you learn about swarm robotics while having fun. So thank you very much to everyone who's worked with me. This is very cross-disciplinary. Uh, and so there's a lot of different partners who have uh, worked with me on all of this. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. It's a great talk. What we're gonna do now is uh, have a Q&A session for all three speakers for about 10 minutes till 10.15. And I'm going to do my best to work with Pigeon here and ask the questions that have the most votes. So you still have a couple seconds to vote on questions. I will try to ask the question for each speaker. And um, if your question isn't asked, remember that you can ask it of the speaker via the chat room over the course of the day. Okay, so the first question is for Talia. And um, it is, is there a difference between people who end up strongly disagreeing versus those who agree? It's a great question. The, the short answer is we don't know, but we assume there must be. Um, in the task that we, our very first conversation ta study that I showed you, the task explicitly was to come to a consensus, to come to an agreement over what the clips were about. And so, um, and all groups did that. So what we haven't seen yet is what happens when people sort of dig their heels in and disagree, what happens in conflict situations, what happens when people are across an ideological divide. And that's a really important question and something that we are turning to now, but we don't have the answer. Great, thank you, Talia. Okay, the next question is for Sabine. Are there implications of your results for how we can shape individual behavior and interactions to produce a more optimal collective output? So a lot of what we do uh, with artificial evolution uh, has to do with figuring out that fitness, that collective performance that we put in the system and then let the automatic, automatic system run so that we can figure out what the local interactions are that would give us an optimal behavior at the global scale. So that works fine when you're in simulation purely. Uh, one of the challenges we have as we start to put this optimization process on the actual robots is that we no longer have a godly view that we can't measure this global performance, which is what we want to optimize against. And as a result, we're trying to find more creative ways of locally figuring out if a robot or a controller is doing a good job. Uh, so that's, that's the holy grail, figuring out the local interactions that give us an optimal or good enough, depending on what you're trying to do, global behavior. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Guy, we have a question. How do you quantify the collective coordination of the school? And by that, the, the question asker means, when schools become uncoordinated, does this mean they split into separate groups? Yeah, we, <clears throat> we have different measures uh, to, to characterize the collective behavior. Uh, at least five, five quantification, basically the, the synchronization, the polarization, the distance between the fish, the distance between the fish and, uh, and the wall, the, the angular orientation, the, the counter milling, I mean, when the, the fish are milling, we have developed also some uh, other uh, uh, quantifiers. And I, uh, if, if you are more interested, I, you, you, can, <laughs> you can read the, the papers. And of course, uh, in some of the, uh, <clears throat> in some of the cases, we do observe uh, some splitting. But it was really interesting, uh, especially when the when the the fish interact only with their uh, their first nearest neighbor. But if a fish if fish only interacts with the, one of the, of the neighbors that has the largest influence on their behavior, uh, we can see that even if fish only interact with just just 
one neighbor, the schools doesn't split. So and th th that was a real surprise for us. Okay, thank you, Guy. Uh, we have another question for Talia. And, uh, and I think there's also, based on the chat discussion, maybe a comment that Anita might want to make. So feel free after Talia answers Anita to make a remark if you'd like to do that. The question is, what are the implications for collective intelligence um, should, of your results, Talia, should CI teams not be composed of friends because of their, resp their responses to information are correlated? Yes, uh, I saw this question. Um, our study looked at diversity in terms of centrality in a group and not friendship, although we have that information so we can look at it. And I think it's a great question. And I'm not, uh, my background actually isn't social network analysis. Um, and I'm not sure maybe someone um, who's listening knows whether friendship, whether centrality clusters in, fr in friendship patterns. But what we found is that the diversity of centrality helps a groups, particularly if you have like a highly central member and not so many other highly central members, like one highly central member can really sort of rally a group, coalesce a group. Um, and so diversity and centrality was really helpful. And I would presume, I share the intuition that diversity in terms of people's different backgrounds, having different uh, inputs is really important for collective intelligence. So I, I would guess that the answer is yes, you don't want to constantly be, you know, in your same clique of friends. Um, but I don't have a strong empirical answer on that. Anita, did you want to make a remark or not? Are you there? Okay, let's move on to another question. Um, let's see. So uh, here's a question. Are the fish, this is for Guy, are the fish affected by reflections of themselves? Do the fish see um, fish they see in the mirrored surface of the back of the tank, for example? I don't understand the question. I mean, uh, the person you... wants to, to know if the fish are affected by their own reflections. By their own ref re reflection. In fact, we didn't really test that. Uh, and uh, yes, probably because <clears throat> um, I know that there exists some. Um, now we can. Uh, perform experiments with virtual environment where we can put uh, a, a virtual image of a fish and we know that fish interact with, uh, with, uh, with virtual fish so maybe we can probably uh, change the, the, the picture of the, of the fish which is pro pro projected on the, on the virtual screen and probably a fish can react to its own, uh, to its own image but the, the the problem is that all fish closely re resemble to, to each other, so there is, I mean, there is no not really no 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 real difference between the between the fish regarding the, their shape and their and their color, at least uh, in the species that we have studied. Okay, thank you, Guy. Um, we have another question for Talia. Uh, that is, how might the results of the conversation study apply to digital conversations? Could this be a driver for the echo chamber effect? we observe in social media? Yes. I mean, I think it has to be the case that uh, when like minds get together and, uh, and just uh, form a kind of a closed, constrained group um, that you're just, and you're not going to get diverse inputs, that of course that's going to be, that's going to lead to echo chambers and maybe, um, I think one question that I raised in the talk was, you know, do we do we just naturally befriend people who are like us? I think probably the answer to that is yes as well. And we're studying, we're studying that now. By uh, last year, actually, as the new cohort of MBA students arrived, we took them off the bus, basically put them in a scanner, showed them the videos before they'd even met each other and then waited several months to collect their social network data to see whether or not we could predict who would become friends based on their initial brain activity. Um, we're just now analyzing those results, so I don't know the answer. And I'm, my hope is that it's not a strong effect, right? That we just kind of find people who think like us and we kind of just hunker down and we don't, add new inputs in, but that is definitely the, the worry that we can 
um, either we come to these groups because we are we we think the same way or just by virtue of shared experience we come to view the world in exactly the same way without increasingly finding avenues for diversity we're going to create these echo chambers naturally great thank you talia i think we're going to stop here so thank you